Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I am Ruchika Chitravanshi. It is 15th of January 2024 and here are the questions we will be answering today. Can non-poaching packs fix high sea level attrition problem? Will interim budget 2024 revive demand and investment? Which three things should you watch out for in banks Q3 results? And what is UPI for secondary market? A number of C-level executives switched sides and joined rival organizations in 2023. While the move possibly put their career on a higher growth trajectory, it left some void in their previous organizations. And with talent in such a short supply, companies struggled to find replacements. IT giants Wipro took two of its former employees to court for allegedly violating agreements. But are such agreements like the non-poaching pact the right fix to retain talent at the top level? Kasturi Akhil finds out. Human resource executives breathed easy in 2023 as attrition across India Inc. came down to 17% in 2023 from a high of 19.7% in 2022. But during the same period, India's major IT companies struggled to retain talent at the top. A number of CEOs, COOs, CFOs and other top-level executives switched sides in search of greener pastures. According to data from NSE-listed companies compiled by Prime Infobase, C-level exits surged 18% from CY 2021 to 166 in CY 2022. In 2023 till October end, 157 MDs and CEOs have quit or are on their way out. It was a double blow to the IT firms, which were already grappling with weak demand due to global slowdown. In December, Wipro and Infosys accused Cognizant of resorting to unethical poaching practices as it hired nearly 20 senior leaders over the past year. Most of those who joined Cognizant were from the two IT companies. Wipro went a step ahead and took two of its former executives, Mohammad Haq and Jatin Dalal, to court after they joined Cognizant. Experts point out that such practices are prevalent not just in IT but across sectors. To curb it, companies enter into no poaching packs with their competitors. No poach and no compete is a very standard clause which is obviously there in most of the offer agreements which are there. And I think it's a very standard practice to add that. And to a degree, I would say 95 to 98 percent people enforce it. Or people who typically violate it is not about the fact that key they have joined a competitor with the malified interest of taking away an IP from this company to another company. So I think it is only those one or two percent cases where there is a very specific breach and there is a very specific IP violation which happens out there. But in terms of this clause being there, the clause is always, I think in most of the offer letters, the clause is there. But how many companies kind of go and enforce that in that strict discipline? How many employees really breach that in that uh, two strict sense, that number is obviously very small. Senior search executives had told media outlets in 2022 that several large Indian businesses advised them against hiring candidates from direct competitors, especially for C-level recruitments, a departure from the past when they were actively engaged in the practice. The same year, Adani Group and Reliance Industries had also signed a non-poaching pact, reportedly after both the behemoths set foot in the common territory of renewable energy and petrochemical businesses. Essentially, employment clauses such as non-compete and non-poaching are more of a gentleman's agreement. Section 27 of the Indian Contract Act 1872 forbids any agreement that restrains anyone from practicing a lawful profession or trade. Non-compete clauses generally seek to deter employees or new employees from joining clients and competitors after a certain time. However, legal experts have said that in India, any obligation of non-competition which extends beyond the term of employment is void and not enforceable. Non-compete agreement is basically entered upon between an employer and employee. 
where is a no poach agreement is entered between two organizations now courts typically have a uh, you know view that whenever it involves an employee they're always pro employee because company is always in a better <clears throat> position to sort of bargain so they uh, so the courts are more you know sort of strict if 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 it involves an employee whereas in a no poach agreement employees are not directly involved it is between two organizations so courts view is a little uh, uh, i would say liberal there that you know the, these contracts are more enforceable they're not in restraint of uh, you know uh, in restraint of trade they are conceded whereas non compete clauses they clearly they are void and they are not enforceable Globally two non-poach agreements are prevalent according to reports foreign courts in some cases have passed restraining orders on senior executives who join a rival firm preventing them from hiring from their former employer on the other hand there also have been cases where no poach agreements have been subject to increased regulatory scrutiny in the US and EU reportedly EU antitrust lawyers have flagged concerns that such practices may unlawfully restrict workers job opportunities Search consultants have suggested several other ways to retain senior talent without resorting to non-poach agreements like rolling out longer tenure employment contracts of 5 years versus 3 earlier and longer notice periods of 6 to 9 months as against 3. Many companies have also started boosting C-level pay packages and are increasingly trying to create high exit barriers. This means they are backloading ESOP vesting and long-term incentive payments usually towards the end of the term of the employment contract to bind top-level executives in longer-term association. Clearly, companies need to focus on long-term solutions like ensuring the right work culture and cultivating a healthy working environment. Employer-employee relationship is also paramount. No poach agreements should be the last resort. A buoyant IT sector is also crucial to the country's economic growth. The sector now contributes about 9% to the national GDP. Moving on, the government is going to table the interim budget on February 1st. Our first part of the special budget series had discussed the likely stance that the budget might take. In the second part today, Bhaswar Kumar explores if it will revive demand and investment or both. The interim budget 2024-25 on February 1 will likely see the central government boost investment while still sticking to the fiscal consolidation path. However, the country may have to wait for a demand stimulus, which is more likely to come with the full budget in July 2024 after the Lok Sabha elections. Well, the choice between uh, investment uh, promotion and demand uh, stimulus uh in any budget is very very critical uh and uh, i'm aware that uh, with uh, very low uh, private consumption demand uh, as indicated in the first advance estimates for 2023 uh, and 24 there will be a natural uh, uh, inclination for the government to go in for some sort of a demand stimulus measures through the interim budget or the full budget that comes after it but given the way the government has handled this challenge so far it seems to me that the government will rather go in for more investment and stay true to the path of fiscal consolidation private final consumption expenditure or pfce is expected to rise to 60.9% of gdp in fy24 from 60.6% in FY23 in nominal terms however private spending growth is projected to slow down to 4.4% in FY24 from 7.5% in FY23 in real terms this is what the first advance estimates of gdp for FY24 released by the national statistical office tell us india ratings principal economist sunil kumar sinha 
told Business Standard that PFCE growth in FY24 would be the slowest since FY03, barring the COVID year of FY21. PFCE is a proxy for household consumption. Meanwhile, Care Ratings Chief Economist Rajani Sinha also sees weak consumption growth as a concern. While the government is still likely to focus on boosting investment, Business Standard's Ruchika Chitravanshi points out that demand and investment are interlinked. Demand and investment both are quite interlinked. Now, we have seen a lot of capex push uh, by this government in the last two years and the general expectation is that this capex push will continue. However, we are now seeing signs and RBI also in uh, an August bulletin had cited a study that said that the private investment, uh, private expenditure is crowding in, which was the purpose of the uh, government push to expenditure as well. Uh, obviously, private uh, uh, private expenditure will also private investment will also increase as demand increases. So, um, as far as demand goes, that's also something that the government has to address, and it can do so. One of the things it can do uh, is keep the fiscal deficit lower. Uh, so now, which means uh, what kind of capex push we will continue to see? How will government balance both both these things? Is something we have to. Uh, watch out for in the interim budget, Bo both are important. The Centre's post-COVID fiscal consolidation plan calls for reducing the fiscal deficit to 4.5% of GDP by FY26. The government has budgeted for a fiscal deficit of 5.9% of GDP in FY24. The fiscal deficit was 6.4% in FY23. So that its commitment to fiscal consolidation is not diluted, the government must ensure that higher investments yield the best results not doing so could pose a risk. When the government increased its capital expenditure quite significantly in the last three years, it uh, compromised on its fiscal consolidation plans to some extent. Now, it has to bring down its fiscal deficit to 4.5% in 2025-26. If it has to do so, then it must make sure that every PESA it spends on its capital investment must get the best results because it is, after all, uh, compromising on its fiscal consolidation plan to some extent. It is important that uh, government investment is uh, uh, directed in sectors where there is a lot of uh, demand for investment from the private sector. And infrastructure sector is one such area where uh, public-private participation uh, uh, as a as a mode can be encouraged. Government CAPEX has been leading investment growth and the first advance estimates of GDP reveal that investment is the main driver of growth in FY24. In real terms, growth in investment demand as represented by Gross Fixed Capital Formation or GFCF is estimated to ease to 10.3% from 11.4% in FY23. Meanwhile, GFCF is expected to rise to 29.8% of GDP in FY24 from 29.2% in FY23 in nominal terms. While growth in investment demand will remain the mainstay of economic recovery, analysts have warned that a broad-based recovery is still some time away and a slowdown in investments in the second half of FY24 is expected. Heading into the interim budget, the government can bank on the continuing revenue buoyancy and a slowdown in expenditure. Nonetheless, will it seek to raise additional revenues on February 1 to increase investments? My assessment is that uh, the government will uh, make its investment plans uh, public in the interim budget, but it will refrain from announcing uh, any measures on raising resources to fund this plan and it will defer it till the full budget to be unveiled in July 2024. With elections around the corner, the government may wish to announce tax giveaways. This would also create a demand stimulus. But as AK Bhattacharya points out, convention demands that there are no tax concessions in an interim budget, even though this convention has been ignored before, like in 2019. Still, given Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman's record, the government will wait for the full budget to announce tax concessions.
IT stocks, meanwhile, rallied about 5% on Friday after TCS and Infosys came out with results which were not as bad as feared by the street initially. Moving on, India's largest private bank, HDFC Bank, is set to roll out the carpet for the banking pack's Q3 earnings. Analysts forecast a muted growth in profits amid marginal increase in net interest income. Margins may continue to compress as deposit rates catch up. In our next report, Nikita Vashisht brings a bird's-eye view of the sector's December quarter earnings and lists the top three things to watch out for. The quarterly results season is gaining momentum, with large private banks set to take over the baton from large-cap information technology companies. On Tuesday, January 16, HDFC Bank will be the first banking giant to announce its December quarter results. This will be followed by ICICI Bank on January 20 and Axis Bank on January 23. According to analysts, the third quarter results will likely be an extension of the theme that played out in the first two quarters of FY24. In our view, Q3 FY24 performance of banks will be similar to the trends that were visible in the first half of the year. Margin compression will continue driven by increased cost of funds and limited scope for yield expansion. Credit growth is expected to remain buoyant, largely driven by the retail and the SME segment and a gradual pickup in corporate lending. Asset quality trends do not look worrying, thus credit costs should remain largely steady, thereby aiding earnings for banks. As per Bloomberg estimates, the entire banking sector is likely to post around 17% year-on-year rise in net profit during the third quarter. This, however, would be a 2.4% dip on a sequential basis. Operationally, net interest income is expected to rise by 11% year-on-year and 2% quarter-on-quarter. Meanwhile, data by the Reserve Bank of India suggests credit in the banking system expanded at 20.2% year-on-year till the middle of December 2023, up from 17.4% a year ago. Bank deposits, on the other hand, grew at 14% year-on-year, up from 9.4% last year. Thus, strategy for deposits mobilization would be among key monitorables this quarter. The media reports that the regulator now wants banks to correct their loan to deposit ratio. Uh, it is very important to see how banks are mobilizing the deposit, especially the retail deposits. Secondly, the outlook on margins as the rates are now catching up, mainly deposit rates and the lending rates are unlikely to go up further as zero, the repo rates have broadly stabilized. Third and the most important thing would be banks commentary on the RBI notification for higher capital adequacy on unsecured credit and banks exposure to NBFC. Analysts expect profit growth to be muted for the pack. However, return on assets could remain healthy as NIM moderation is off a high base. This week, quarter three earnings and wholesale inflation data for December will be key market triggers. Angel One, Geo Financial Services, Federal Bank, HDFC Bank, LTTS, Asian Paints, ICICI Credential Life Insurance, HUL, and Paytm are among the prominent companies slated to announce their results during the week. He's making plans for an early retirement. Business Standard. Meanwhile, in good news, UPI is set to change the way we buy stocks in the secondary market. After the primary market, the UPI-enabled ASBA facility is set to be launched in the secondary market. It is at the testing stage now. Kasturi Akhil has more on it in our Explainer segment. After revolutionizing retail payments, UPI is set to change the way we trade in stocks. The National Payment Corporation of India has launched a new UPI-based facility for stock trading in the secondary market, called UPI for Secondary Market. This feature allows investors to block funds for trading in their bank accounts instead of transferring it to a broker's account first for trade placement. 
This means that investors now have the option to block funds in their saving accounts, which will only be debited by the clearing corporations after trade confirmation during the settlement period. The clearing corporations will then directly process the payout to clients on a T plus one basis, thereby streamlining the trade settlement process, which will be completed within one day period from the day of the transaction. This mechanism is optional and works on similar lines as the application supported by Blocked Amount or ASBA in the primary market. ASBA is essentially an application given by an investor either physically or electronically to the designated bank certified by the market regulator Securities and Exchange Board of India, which authorizes the bank to block the application money in the bank account for subscribing to a share issue. Currently, this initiative is in the beta phase, specifically meant for the equity cash segment, where only a select group of pilot customers will have access to the facility. The beta launch is being facilitated by Grow as a brokerage app, alongside PIM, Grow, and YesPay Next as UPI apps. As of now, customers of only HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank will be able to avail the new feature. The move is aimed at integrating UPI payments in the secondary market to enhance the efficiency and flexibility of transactions involved in stock trading. I'm backed by the nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. But we will still need brokerage firms as they play a crucial role in helping investors in buying or selling of stocks by using their infrastructure and applications for execution of the trade. Well, that's all we have for you today. For more news and analysis, please log on to business-standard.com. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.